So, Courtney, why why did you try to take my life? What? I uh, I was almost the subject of a road raid. Road raid. Hi, welcome. <laughs> I'm Mealy Mouth Michael. Uh, of a road rage assassination by oh, someone that. in a bread box automobile, <laughs> and uh, I'm I'm still recovering. I thought it was you for a moment. Well, it is a Kia Steel Souls. That is what the name is for. So indeed. And Michael, did I tell you about this? No, I don't think you have. So we were exiting the Sprouts parking lot off of Thunderbird over here, by where I live. And as we were leaving, Melissa was driving. Naturally, these things only happen when she's behind the wheel. And, hey, what do, you, uh, what do you mean by that there, Shane? She's because just very unlucky. She, her luck and and mine are diametrically opposed from one another. Like, if any crazy asshole is going to be on the road, she'll be the one driving. Like, it's she's the one who has to suffer these things. I'm is just that because you're the crazy asshole life. if you're the one driving? Generally, yes. I mean, you see what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm the craziest asshole in these here parts. <laughs> I'm actually really <laughs> mellow behind the wheel of an automobile. And considering that I come from a road rage family, that's impressive. Um, I'm not talking about my father on this show. Um, in any event. <laughs> legal says I can't. Yes, legal has sent me a very strongly worded letter about discussing my father. Um, so in any event, we're leaving this and there is a pair of automobiles that are racing towards us at breakneck pace. One of them is a, you know, small little sporty SUV and the other is a bread box Kia that is baby <laughs> shit brown. It's a uh. horrible color. Has the most entitled looking white woman I've ever encountered in my adult life and that's saying something. <laughs> <laughs> This woman didn't have a double chin. She had a second head. And uh, <laughs> she's got the elbows up and she's angrily cruising and just drove straight at us. If John were here right now, he's coming right for us. Uh, and yeah, it nearly had head on collision because this bitch wanted to get in front of another driver. And then she angrily at about 45 miles an hour in a parking lot, looking like Marty McFly trying to outrun the Libyans, <laughs> zoomed over to the goddamn uh, Dutch brothers and went in line. And I was like, if it really meant that much to you, you must be jonesing for a goddamn Golden Eagle right oh, now. Oh, man, I got to get my fix, man. I, 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 I got to fix it. Listen, I love a white zombie as much as anybody else. Truly, I do. But, I mean, dear God, wait a minute. Not are as much as she names? is. drink names? Yeah. Yes, those are drink names oh at the Dutch God. Brothers. It's fun going through there. You have to have, like, your year's worth of social activity with the good folks just trying to give you a caffeinated beverage. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Uh-huh. <laughs> And speaking of those who are uncaffeinated by the eternal, behold, behold, it's the Disinformed Podcast. I'm Shane. I'm Michael. I'm Courtney. Had to start off with a little rage this evening, it <laughs> seems appropriate. Uh, and to the family of Podcaster John, we wish you many safe returns and we hope that flight turns out all right. Be a shame if the cabin depressurized at 32,000 feet. Damn shame. And uh, I want to send a major shout out of congratulations to superfan Michael. Dr. Michael, if you will. Uh, as of right now, seems like he's on the verge of owning his first home. Nice. A lovely six bedroom swank household in uh, you know a state that I won't name. But it does mean that we're going to be far closer to Courtney finally receiving that actual animal in the mail. <laughs> There may be a possum winging our way via FedEx if uh, oh. Dr. Michael has his way. Finally. So congratulations, buddy. Couldn't have, To a nicer guy, it couldn't have happened. Guaranteed. Truly. We got one of the great human beings. Uh, I don't know how we lucked out, but we did. Delightful And then times. we have this sorry sack of Michael here in front of us today. I'm the disappointment. The scales I, I'm okay with they, that. They have to balance somehow, you know. <laughs> Karma plays a sick game. I'm his anti-Michael. Oh. Indeed. <laughs> Are you his evil Michael to hit the good Michael? I do have a mustache, so yeah, I'm his evil, Indeed. evil twin. I'm going to buy you a, a red Star Trek shirt for Christmas. Oh, man. Ouch. 
Also, uh, I'm very glad that you're rocking the the super stylish, uh, you know, soaking wet tea this evening. Oh yeah, it's uh, we're that's going to be part of the after dark. Is going to be a wet t shirt contest. Ooh, you're I can already down, see buddy. your nipples. So you lost. <laughs> I didn't. I had no. I had no goals of winning. I knew I was going to lose. It's a fun game to lose, though. You got uh, two people on this call with at least a D cup, so I don't know how you're going to get over the hump. So, as it were. But in any event, for the uninitiated amongst you who are not on the lookout for humps or wet t-shirts, what we typically do on this show is delve into random esoteric nonsense. And as we explain it to one another and to you, the lovely listeners, we lie about it. That is the shtick. The co-hosts have to pay attention because they have to try to ferret out the fact from fiction as we listen. But of course, you at the audience can, you at the audience, you and the audience can just hang out. Just kick your feet up, relax, enjoy. And you want to know why? Because regardless of whether or not these assholes figure out what the lies are, we'll tell you at the end of the episode what we were fibbing about and why it was almost funny that one time. So uh, it's going to be a delightful evening because we went to the listeners today, friends. Woo! Audience, we have those? Engagement! Yes. All five of them. We polled the audience this evening. <laughs> To determine what the topic was going to be, but I admittedly am at a bit of a quandary. Because the topic that was chosen was really geared toward the favorite things of everyone on the call, typically. And I'll tell you why. Because uh, there's going to be some science, there's going to be some animals, and there's going to be some shit. And <laughs> oh, man. And I, I feel like I would be remiss... If I did that without John actually being here to appreciate the fecal talk. And so I'm I'm almost on the verge of doing the other topic. One, to subvert expectation because we lie here. That is part of the <laughs> shtick. And two, because I, I feel like I will I will feel bad in spite of all my slander that I didn't let John take part in a very poop centric episode. So I'm going to leave it to you two to decide whether or not we're going to do them dirty like that or uh, or if we're going to go the other way. Hmm. I'm down with the dirty. I'm down okay. With the dirty. <laughs> All right. Michael's Back for sedition. Over here. Oh, All yeah. right. You know what? I, I, I can I can pretend to like poop for a night. <laughs> oh, no. Famous last words. Well, now oh, we have no. to do it. Now Michael has to lean in really hard. Okay. All right. Here we go. Uh, well, uh, with that said, uh, apologies, former podcaster John. Uh, this is, uh, it's not your night, friend. We're going to do what the audience asks for the first time ever. <laughs> and uh, this evening I have four lies for you. I'm going to start this in a very Courtney and Michael-esque <gasps> way. Ooh. I'm not. I'm going to do oh, my normal okay. shit. Normal. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> There exists a metaphysical tug of war in the American educational system between the concept of human evolution and divine creationism. Strange, I know. <laughs> but that war is merely a symptom of the greater political conflict between conservative and liberal ideologies worldwide. Still mostly United States, <laughs> unfortunately. America! Oh. Ultimately, though, we're not getting political again this week. I got enough of that out of my system last week. <laughs> Hi, Jan Brewer. Fucking moron. <laughs> I fought Obama. Oh, I'm sure you did. Yes, that's why your face looks that way, you goddamn trumped up trollop. Anyway. <laughs> Get him! Sorry. More of that YouTube content that we're not trying to make. Um, In any event... <laughs> There is admittedly a degree of speculation on both sides of the argument, which of course leads to the conclusions being drawn. One could argue that evolution has a considerable quantity of evidence based on facts when compared to creationism. What? But you know, there are some that claim this is still up for debate if you trust the dusty diary of a martyred Babylonian. But <laughs> I digress. Anyway. True. Yeah. However... Certain arguments, like the one I will be presenting this evening, may help to explain the dismay that is felt by many God-loving devotees of divinity. 
With your mind's eye, here's where I'm getting into the Michael of it all. Let's imagine <laughs> Homo erectus. Calm down, Michael. Damn it. It's a species, not a lifestyle. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, Put your I can pants be swayed. Back on. I can be swayed. I can be swayed. I'm not putting my pants back on. I've told you, I am recording without them from now on. But I was talking to Michael, but. Indeed. Man. All right. So, Homo erectus. <laughs> Damn near killed us. Um, <laughs> is a now extinct species of hominids, hominids, that stood upright and became the first of our ancestors to move beyond a single continent, or so we're told. For the uninitiated, early Homo erectus fossils from Africa, sometimes labeled Homo ergaster, are our oldest known relatives to have possessed modern human-like body proportions, although with relatively elongated legs and shorter arms compared to the size of the torso. Is These the, features... Is the Homer erectus a lie? Or, 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 or gaster? No, that oh. is not. Huh, I've never heard Unless that Unless you before. ask a conservative Christian. Yeah, I was going to say our oldest ancestors are actually Adam and Eve, so you're wrong. Yeah, that's a weird name for Adam is Homo erectus. Very weird. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's why the Adam the... and Steve story. We don't talk about that. <laughs> that's why he was a snake charmer. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't get Eve to pay attention, but the second that serpent shows up, hey, <laughs> here's the fruit of life, and it's me. <laughs> Anywho, uh, so these features are, of course, considered adaptations uh, to a life lived on the ground, naturally, indicating the loss of the earlier tree climbing uh, proliferations, as it were, with the ability to walk and possibly run for long distances, something that the ancestors, me in particular, do not have in common with them. But uh, compared with earlier fossil humans, they possess an expanded brain case relative to the size of their face, so it, hence the brow which is quite delightful. Microscopic study of their teeth also indicate that they progressed at a similar growth rate to that of a great ape as opposed to humans. Hmm. There is, of course, fossil evidence that this species cared for old and infirm individuals as well, something not typically uh, known for animal species. Oh, I thought you were going to say something typically not known in today's society. <laughs> yes. uh, yeah, agreed. <laughs> You're not wrong. I've seen Twitter. Uh, and I've seen our former president as well. He's definitely not in for caring for the infirm. Uh, but the, imp the appearance of Homo erectus in the fossil record is often associated with the earliest hand axes as well, which is the first major innovation in stone tool technology, Ooh. which is a new company that Michael and I will be starting <laughs> next week based on my expertise having lived since this era and uh, <laughs> Michael's genuine ingenuity. <laughs> next sure. week, wheels. <laughs> I could bang enough rocks together to get an axe going. We're not talking about <laughs> wheels yet. That's a bit too much for me. I resemble one, but that's where the concept <laughs> falls short. Keep trying to put tits on them. It just doesn't work. Anyway, so since we've conjured this in our mind's eye, that vivid picture being in place, we'll begin. Roughly two million years ago, these creatures, some of whom eventually evolved into Homo sapiens, began to expand their range beyond Africa, roaming into lands now known as Asia and Europe. Along the way, these nomadic neo-sapiens track herds of animals in search of a sustainable food source, as you would expect, because no one wants to starve, and subsequently encountered considerable quantities of bestial dung and furthermore discovered an array of new nourishing plants. That is, of course, the version of the human origin story widely accepted by scientists. Fake news. So we'll, indeed. <laughs> no, it's just two people that went, me. <laughs> well, and, and then God told them not to do that because the nyeh is a, what is it called? Sword fighting nowadays, so. Ooh. Well... If I'm Cain, you're able. So, <laughs> Cain with me, all Daddy? Of, <laughs> indeed. Oh. I plan to be condemned for eternity, but that is Thursday. In any event, <laughs> with all of this said, a more radical interpretation of these events involves 
the same flora, fauna, and subsequent dung. Somewhere John's incredibly turgid, but uh, it's not here. And it veers slightly from the normative narrative and into the realm of the psychedelic. <laughs> what I refer to is in 1992, ethnobotanist and mind expansion advocate Terence McKenna argued in the book Food of the Gods that what enabled Homo erectus to evolve into Homo sapiens was its encounter with magic mushrooms. Specifically, oh. psilocybin, the psychedelic compound within them, on this particular journey. He dubbed this the stoned ape hypothesis. <laughs> no shit. Really? I'm not kidding. That is its <laughs> given title. Why? I just. Well, they're oh. monkeys. <laughs> Gotta feed the monkey. So it's important to note that McKenna spoke and wrote about a variety of subjects, not strictly psychedelic drug use. He detailed plant-based uh, enthogens, shamanism, metaphysics, alchemy, language, philosophy, culture, technology, and environmentalism, as well as positing theoretical origins of human consciousness. McKenna was playfully labeled the Timothy Leary of the 90s, and one of the leading authorities on the ontological foundations of shamanism, and the intellectual voice of rave culture. If that just doesn't scream to you from the front of a poster somewhere, I don't know what will. Yeah, he's a can great PR that. team. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. he's being advertised everywhere, but like not online. Still on the pictures that they put up on uh, electric poles and all that stuff. What they're saying is he is a functioning wake and baker, and there's not a lot of those in the world, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. it robs you of your ambition, as I was told in school. Is the shaman stuff true? Yes, we will get into that later. I assure you, there is no end to the profundity of this discussion. Oh no, Andy. you're gonna love this. <laughs> <laughs> and the environmentalism is environmental. Also true, yes. Hmm. We will discuss this. I, it's all tied up in a beautiful little bow by the end of this discussion, I promise. All right, all right. As a peculiar point of fact, and this will impact all of us very strangely given our most recent discussion at Fan Fusion, McKenna's ideologies are seen and felt in various ways throughout our culture, even predating his book's initial publication. In a pair of particular instances, his theories are known to have impacted Stanley Kubrick's adaptation of Arthur C. Clarke's work, 2001, A Space Odyssey. Huh. McKenna and Kubrick were actually loose associates, despite Kubrick being 18 years McKenna's senior. Kubrick was introduced to McKenna's concepts while attending a lecture Terence gave at Columbia University in 1968, apparently prompted to attend by another famed psychedelophant... Ken Kesey, who is a noted American novelist, essayist, and counterculture figure that famously penned One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest in 1962, oh. which Nicholson later starred in, so there's a fun little, you know, treasure trove of connectivity between friends here. Uh, he was also considered the link between the beat generation of the 50s and the hippies of the 60s. So... While you would likely presume, as I did, that the simian interaction with the monolith at the beginning of the film could be attributed to McKenna's notions, you would be partially right. You just picked the wrong object. What Kubrick actually lifted from McKenna was his perspective on time, specifically McKenna's adaptation of mathematician and philosopher Alfred North Whitehead's concept of concrescence. Now here's where I'm going to get Michael's nipples erect. <laughs> Concrescence, as a concept, indicates that time speeds up more act as more activity or novelty appears in the universe. Huh. So, as an example, the more activity in terabytes of data flow now in a single day than appeared in perhaps the first billions of years of the universe, as we reckon it. And so that's just taking into account John's bathroom viewing habits, okay? Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I digress. Thus, by McKenna's reckoning, our society is now believed to be entering the concrescence. This is, I'll, I'll get around to that term. So, according to McKenna, time doesn't flow via a push from the past, but instead it's drawn forward by a pull from the future. So think of like Christopher Nolan's Interstellar having a baby with Zemeckis' contact, okay? 
So instances that will occur are the thing that are essentially building up all of our centripetal force moving that direction. Whitehead labeled this pull as the attractor, and it is bringing us towards the eschaton or the end of days, the end of the world, essentially, or the transcendental object at the end of all time. So imagine like, you know, a black hole's gravity in spite of the fact that we don't actually see what the attractant is. It is something that is still present and is pulling everything that direction. That is the great end of time. So that's kind of what this theory is positing. Hmm. So this notion was then represented by the enigmatic monolith that appears throughout 2001 A Space Odyssey. So just as a bearing rolls towards the bottom of a bowl when dropped, time is then drawn to the eschaton, i.e. the end of the world. So, everybody with me so far? Yeah. Exciting, yes? Yeah. <laughs> I imagine it'll be less dense, but I had to get science for a little bit here. I haven't really tweaked Michael for a minute. That's true, and I love it when you talk science, so Indeed. I'm all, you, I'm all happy. You've been so on edge for so long that I feel like I have to get you a little service and finally get the <sighs> shotgun blast out of you so you'll just calm down. The release was fantastic. Also, the end of days, <laughs> strangely enough. I like that I just swallowed after you said that, too. (laughs) Just as is foretold by the prophecy. Indeed. Let's prove the uh, Romani right tonight. (laughs) All right. So, McKenna is further noted for having formulated a concept about the nature of time based on fractal patterns he claimed to have discovered in the I Ching. And for fans of our PKD episode, you can see a lot of similarities with the man in the high castle. I have no idea whether those two inter- ever interacted with one another, but they were both floating around in the 60s, so it's not outside the realm of possibility. Yeah. They would have gotten along great, I guarantee it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, however, Kenna in- McKenna intended to get stoned. PKD did it just as a rite of passage, I think. But in any event, McKenna called this novelty theory, proposing that it predicted the end of time and a transition of consciousness, which strangely enough occurred to him in the year 2012. His hmm, his curious. promotion of novelty theory and its connection to the Mayan calendar is actually one of the things credited as a factor leading to the widespread belief about the 2012 eschatology. Huh. Is that so, true? That is true. Huh. People actually, huh. uh, Terrence McKenna helped to formulate the idea that 2012 is going to be the end of days. For Michael's sake, however, I am going to note that the novelty theory is considered pseudoscience. Yeah, that sounds pretty reasonable to me. I Mm -hmm. would definitely agree. Mm -hmm. Checks out. So, with all of our laboratory-laden discussion out of the way here, let's get back to the ape rave, okay? So, McKenna posited that psilocybin, presumably discovered via dung-encrusted mushrooms, caused the primitive brain's information processing capabilities to rapidly reorganize, in turn kickstarting the rapid evolution of cognition that led to early art, language, and technology documented in Homo sapiens' archaeological record. As early humans, McKenna said we ate our way to higher consciousness by consuming these mushrooms, which he hypothesized sprouted in a few in a slew of animal manure, as it were. Psilocybin, he claims, brought us out of the animal mind and into the world of articulated speech and imagination. <laughs> He's switching voices. It, it distracted me too much. <laughs> I'm sorry. We stopped being beasts and we started being bigger beasts. That's essentially what he's driving at. We can just justify our violence now, so it's different. I mean, <laughs> I need my AK to kill boars, man. Boars well, are a big issue. Welcome to Colorado. <laughs> 30 to 50 feral hogs. Indeed. They're going to get my children. Unfortunately, they were referring to the uh, Republican representatives of that state, I believe. But They're going to get your children. Indeed. They're going to take them to drag bars. I mean, churches. <laughs> <laughs> if only. Man, that would I know, be a far right? more entertaining service. <laughs> I feel the hoping. power of the Lord all through me. <laughs> and down my chest. I don't know what's happening. Why did you touch me? In any event, 
As human cultural evolution expanded into the domestication of wild cattle, humans began to naturally discover food amidst their dung, as McKenna explained. We're reiterating these points, but it helps to illustrate that due to the uh, desertification of the African continent at this time, the human forerunners were forced out of the increasingly shrinking tropical canopy in pursuit of new food sources. So he believed they started initially following large herds of wild cattle, whose dung harbored the insects, which he proposed were also undoubtedly part of their new diet. But then they would subsequently begin to sort of herd the animals and, in getting larger quantities of their dung in concentrated spaces, would then discover the Psilocybe cubensis, a dung-loving mushroom often found, oddly enough, growing out of cow pats. And consciousness bloomed. <laughs> no, I, I always figured shit had something to do with my consciousness. Hey, shit happens. Yeah, there you go. And then, poof. Indeed. It was, in fact, the shit. Oof. That's true. Not the shits. The shit. Just the shit. Mm -hmm. So uh, McKenna then proposed that the transformation from humans' early ancestors, Homo erectus, took place in around 100,000 BCE, which is when he believed that the species diverged from the genus Homo. Calm yourselves. Uh, so McKenna then based his theory on the main effects or alleged effects produced by the mushroom while citing studies by Roland Fisher et al. from the late 1960s and early 1970s. Sorry, I got a little bit of that bubbly popping up on me here. Mm. So... Whilst rifling through shit is not necessarily a pastime that we all enjoy, the foundation of McKenna's hypothesis, probably not his, based on his personal peccadillos, but it's the idea that low doses of psilocybin improves visual acuity first, and particularly edge detention, or detention, detection, which means that the presence of psilocybin in the diet of early pack-hunting primates caused the individuals who were consuming psilocybin mushrooms to be better hunters than those who were not. Oh. So they began to outpace their contemporaries by using the drugs. This would then result in increased food supply and in turn a higher rate of reproductive success. Because you got the energy for the uh, thrust squats, as it were. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm still on a shit mine. So when you said thrust, uh, thrust, thrust, thrust squats, thrust, <laughs> thrust the, hunger, the thrust squats, mm -hmm. I immediately went to something else. So, well, I mean, they could have got down on it if they were already eating out of shit. They might as well just, you know, had an orgiastic sort of experience. And we'll, now John is fully erect. Indeed. Well, we'll get to this later because that does play a role in oh, this discussion. No. Oh. So, admittedly, I know you thought that was the line. Here is where we actually start to run off the rails a bit. At slightly higher doses of psilocybin consumption, he contended, the mushroom would act to sexually arouse, leading to a higher level of attention, more energy in the organism. <clears throat> and potential erection in the males, rendering it even more evolutionarily beneficial as it would result in more offspring. So shit is an aphrodisiac. John well, was right the whole time. <laughs> no. The psychologists everywhere are not going to allow me to stamp that statement. Drug use is an arousal, uh, according to this, and so we might be able to dabble with that, but... And then, at even higher doses, McKenna then proposed that the mushroom would have acted to dissolve boundaries, promoting <laughs> community bonding, group sexual activities, and the eventual metaphysical transcendence into a greater understanding of the connectivity of all things, i.e. grasping their place in the pastiche of the rich tapestry of nature. He also asserted that Native American lore about connectivities with the animals and personification of natural elements as evidence of his theory. So when you think of spirit mother and, uh, you know, s strange little coyotes running around and how you are a part of them, I'm poorly extrapolating. <laughs> this is essentially what he's saying can be linked to psilocybin uses that they saw themselves in the animals they consumed, etc. So he's saying that 
Native American culture is kind of derived from the psilocybin thing, even though we're talking about a good 80,000 years in the future between them getting, like, spreading out. I see what you mean. But I think it's one of the few sort of remnants of tribal culture that he was readily able to reference and access then. Because oh. I don't think he was actually traipsing into sub-Saharan, sub-Saharan Africa. He certainly wasn't wading into the rainforests trying to find things in South okay. America either. So I think that was the closest sort of bead that he had to explain to other people how tribalism can be connected here. Because, okay. I, I mean, we did try to essentially exterminate it in this country, but we did yes. a fair bit of studying. And thankfully, there are many representatives of that culture who have brought their uh, general ways forward. And so you haven't lost greater traditions and you do understand a lot of the origin stories, etc., from the oral history, which we've kind of lost elsewhere. Okay. So consequently, there would be a mixing of genes, greater genetic diversity, and of course a communal sense of responsibility for group offspring. So it would make them more inclined to act as a herd together themselves or as a general pride essentially as opposed to just going out there and and winging it as a solo soldier they weren't trying to jason born their way out of the serengeti essentially (laughs) (laughs) no i would like to see that indeed (laughs) a lone ape tries to get his way out of the sahara jason erectus (laughs) (laughs) yeah he immediately changes his hair he's like they'll never know it was me (laughs) Still, uh, you know, have to include a strange German woman riding with him everywhere. This is a requirement. Right. Indeed. She's a time traveler. We'll just Everyone else can still be <laughs> apes and all that other stuff, but she's just a German woman. Jason, why are we commandeering a VW bug? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. If you would like to buy this script, please contact us. <laughs> I'd like to buy a vowel. Um, <laughs> and that would be an E. So... At these higher doses, McKenna also argued that psilocybin would be triggering activity in the language-forming region of the brain as well, manifesting as music and visions, and thus catalyzing the emergence of language in early hominids by expanding their arboreally evolved repertoire of troop signals. So... I do have to ask, is him just pulling all this information about increased psilocybin use, like, just Mm -hmm. out of his ass? Or is this actually documented, like, you take a little bit, you know, you start thinking Mm -hmm. all strange, and you take too much, you descend into a group consciousness and have orgies with shit or something? So... We'll discuss the criticisms of his theories as we move forward. I do have a section, so we'll get into some of this. (laughs) That answers uh, my question, then. He (laughs) is pulling some of this from the Fisher research, as I was alluding to earlier, but there's a lot of debate about whether or not he was making the appropriate conclusions based on that research. Got it. So, okay. Michael, I thought you watched the Netflix documentary about mushrooms, because in the first episode, I want to say they talk about this a little bit. Um, I was really high when I watched it, and <laughs> when they stopped showing mushrooms growing, I got really bored because okay, I didn't so want to hear someone talking about them. This is proof right now, <laughs> essentially disproving McKenna's theory, because if evolved Michael won't even pay attention because of the mushrooms. Yeah. Our well, progenitors couldn't have fared much better. To be no. fair, it wasn't psilocybin, it was just marijuana, but... ah. Well, as I said, robs you of your ambitions. So <laughs> I could watch this and have a better understanding of mushrooms or fuck it. <laughs> so uh, naturally, uh, McKenna then concluded that psilocybin would eventually dissolve the ego and quote unquote religious concerns would be at the forefront of the tribe's consciousness simply because of the power and strangeness of the experience itself. <laughs> He's American. I don't know why I've turned him into like, the I'm narrator of Winnie some, the Pooh. Some highfalutin but. British intellectual over here. <laughs> it's just appropriate given the subject matter, I feel. But. That's, that's fair. That's fair. So finally, according to McKenna, the access to and ingestion of mushrooms was essentially an evolutionary advantage to humans' omnivorous hunter-gatherer ancestors and therefore provided humanity's first religious impulse. 
He believed that psilocybin mushrooms were the evolutionary catalyst from which language, projective imagination, the arts, religion, philosophy, science, and of course all human culture then sprang. Consequently, as psilocybin mushrooms commonly grow in cow shit, as we've documented, the human-mushroom interspecies codependency was enhanced and deepened. And it was at this time that religious ritual, calendar-making, and natural magic came into their own. I am getting big Lemuria vibes. Like, the, the cotton <laughs> of lemurs. Like, I... I it, it probably didn't help with the, the voice that you were giving him, but I feel like this is some old as fuck British, like, 80-year-old person from the early 1800s that just, like, did a line of coke because mm. they had that at that time, and then just, like, what if all this is connected? Yeah, sadly, no, this is a uh, a dude that grew up in uh, San Francisco in the 40s and just, uh, you know, <laughs> enjoyed his uh, little mushroom buttons just a little too much. But you're missing the best part of this whole thing, Michael, because because of that, McKenna further postulated, as an example, that this might be the origin for the deification of cattle in the Vedic Hindu religion, as the cow, of course, fundamentally represents the path to enlightenment for uncultured man. Oh, my God. Oh, no. I, I mean, hey, listen, if you're following the cow, cow defecates. You eat said, you know, defecation, and then you start having visions and seeing things which admittedly would terrify you with an undeveloped consciousness as another animal. So you're seeing things that don't exist. You're fighting spirits out of the sky. Then you engage in group orgies and just, you know, lay there staring, slack jawed, drilling at the sky. That creature is going to be sacred to you, is it not? And the way you described it, our descendants were just Michael, like, yes. Me, no. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Man, what a life to live. John, yes. Shane, no. You got to you gotta eat some cow shit, but like tribal well, orgies hey, and, and- Hey, people's, Ooh. you know, uh, adoration of cows is the only way I've ever had sex. So, I mean, let's not <laughs> beat this over the head too much. Oh, Courtney, no. you were saying- well, I just really struggle with the idea that that was the only way they were coming across mushrooms at the time because yeah. we know that mushrooms grow in so many different types of substrate. Mm -hmm. they, the spores float through everywhere that we breathe, essentially. Mm -hmm. The whole world is a mushroom in my mind. We're just little frogs living Well, on it. you know, to your point, though, like some of those are just regular mushrooms that would have been there for sustenance. Others probably right. would have been poisonous, so we wouldn't have had the individuals who lived beyond that. <laughs> So there is something to be said for the rationalization of saying that the ones that gave people a trip would have expanded their consciousness. Because, I mean, the other ones, like, they might have found them once or twice. And they sure. found them as a naturally occurring event. And then it's just incidental, right? They can't find them. They weren't harvesting them so much as just, like, grabbing them ravenously and then running. So... For those that actually developed sort of a cultured way of, one, finding them repetitively and using them frequently would would have actually factored into some evolutionary response. So I, I see what you're saying, but I also can see what he's saying as well on the opposite end of the spectrum. And, and then is the religious stuff bullshit? <laughs> it's the religious stuff um no in point of fact he does say it was an evolutionary catalyst for them to discover arts religion philosophy like all of these things he say absolutely had to have developed from us first because i mean otherwise we wouldn't really have had cognition in the way that we reckon it currently so why would you start thinking of a higher power I mean, granted, some things would still be terrifying. A rainstorm would still be catastrophic because you have no way to respond to it and you can't hurt it with a stick, right? So uh, some of these things, like, granted, we're, we're thinking about it too hard because we're further sure. along on the evolutionary scale. But I mean, <laughs> how I, what it's addressing is how these thoughts were first injected into our consciousness. Right. And if it's something that has to be a naturally occurring event. Uh, you know, short of a supernatural event occurring wherein an actual divine deity did descend and touch us on the top of the head and go, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that we would have gotten there. So, yeah, I, I definitely like this theory a lot more than ancient aliens. 
I would say. <laughs> Ancient but, Aliens is fun, though. It is. It is in its own way. They uh, just but touch I, us in a different way and say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but I also did want to agree that, like, uh, given because they've they've uh, done studies for monkeys and they actually had found that they will brew their own sort of liquor. Uh, some species of monkeys they will take uh fruit and just store it somewhere to ferment and then they would eat it. They would um I think some species of birds and a lot of monkeys and apes will actually seek out these uh fermented fruits and eat them specifically to get drunk. So okay, even before he, uh Homo sapiens. Uh, it would, I can understand our descendant or descendants, our ancestors having that propensity to mm-hmm. seek things that made them feel good. Obviously. I yeah, mean, it, you know, we're, we're living on a limited experience here. Exactly. Have you actually heard the discussion presently that based on our studying uh, particular ape species, that they are actually certain species in areas of the world are reaching the stone age? That they've actually begun to fashion tools and use them without, and some of it is from actually watching human tribes yeah. and adapting it, but others are picking up things and, and crafting tools on their own. Yeah, I think it was um, some some orangutans in Sumatra or something yes, like that. Yes, they're and using then... spears to fish. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fascinating stuff. It's amazing. Quite. It's so cool. <laughs> So it's just interesting to be in this time where we're seeing an evolutionary parallel, at least. So let's find those monkeys, let's feed them some mushrooms, and let's see what shakes out. That's what I'm saying. Who knows, in it any might event, make a better society than we have right now. So You make a fine point. Uh, we do have a lot of uh, injected apes living amongst us. It's just different. I'll talk <laughs> about one in a moment here. But Uh-oh. in any event, uh, McKenna, <laughs> who died in the, uh, in the year 2000, passionately and vehemently believed his hypothesis, but it was never seriously considered by the scientific community in his lifetime. (laughs) Crambo. Um, I wonder why. (laughs) It was, of course, dismissed as excessively speculative, as Michael was alluding to, and uh, McKenna's hypothesis now only pops up occasionally in online message boards and Reddit pages dedicated to psychedelics. Uh, as you would expect, noted uh, psychedelophant Joe Rogan is one of McKenna's modern-day acolytes. Go figure. Huh. But again, that man purportedly ingested ivermectin to treat COVID, so let's not go basing any of our assessments on his particular proclivities, okay? <laughs> I mean, have Let you ever taken... Let the man take his medicine. If he wants to take DMT, I think everyone should take DMT. You want to take DMT? Doesn't he just ask people that like constantly? On well, the he's show? very he's very big on DMT, and I was actually discussing this with Superfan Steven as well. Is that uh, Rogan was discussing a theory which claimed that Moses was actually hallucinating on DMT <laughs> when he saw the burning bush? Because the um, <laughs> no, this is a thing. It's believed that the acacia tree is what was catching fire near him, and that is a uh, it's a plant that has a very heavy concentration of DMT in it. Oh. So if if he was inhaling that in large quantities, it's very possible that he was simply hallucinating and hearing voices that way. So there's a theory. I will send you all a link to this. Huh. It's not. I, I wouldn't <laughs> want to no, do it as an episode, yeah. but I'll send you a link to the article. It's fascinating. It doesn't sound that far off, that no. far fetched, huh? It sounds a little more reasonable to me than you know a divine creator reaching out and chatting with him about etching stuff onto stones. But again, I digress. Uh, this is not the religion podcast, unfortunately. We're just giving both sides of the argument. Don't look at the satanic <laughs> episodes in the uh, Flying Spaghetti Monster episode. No, and... <laughs> never. We don't espouse anything that's uh, strongly biased one way, shape, or form in any event. So here's what Michael's been salivating over for the entire time. In point of fact, the stoned ape theory received very little attention at all from the scientific community, and though when it has, it's been criticized for a relative lack of citation to any of the paleoanthropological evidence informing our understanding of human origins. His ideas regarding psilocybin and visual acuity have been criticized as misrepresentation of Fisher et al.'s findings, who who published studies about visual perception in terms of various specific parameters, not acuity, specifically. (laughs) So he just kind of took that and ran in another direction, unfortunately. 
Criticism has also been expressed due to the fact that in a separate study on psilocybin induced transformation of visual space, Fisher stated <laughs> that psilocybin may not be conducive to survival of the organism. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you can do this, but you won't last. <laughs> If yeah, if you just spend your whole day just tripping on shrooms, I can't imagine you have a lot of time to go get food. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't guess. say. Now, if you had enough cows in the same spot, hopefully you don't misplace them, because otherwise we'd be seeing that famous sequel, "Dude, Where's My Cow?" And <laughs> well, if there are enough cows, then I guess you could just survive off the shit. So I guess so. But again, we're also taking into account these folks apparently followed these herds transcontinentally, so might not be a reasonable theory, but in any event. Just uh, follow the shit <laughs> leads you to the promised it land. It goes all the way to the top. <laughs> Big Speak shit's out to get you. <laughs> Speaking of shit, there's also a lack of scientific evidence that psilocybin increases sexual arousal, so... We'll note that, and even if it does, it doesn't necessarily entail an evolutionary advantage. Just means someone's running around with a boner for longer, I'm sure. <laughs> as long as it's not more than four hours, because they should seek a doctor. He's also screaming at the sky and trying to penetrate it with it, I'm fairly certain. If you had, uh, you know, an erection in a rainstorm, <laughs> trying to make love to the clouds. <laughs> Takes the whole concept of having sex with a god. Maybe that's where Zeus came from. Always Ooh. boning like mortal hu uh, women and all that stuff. And you see, oh, I was over shit. here thinking, oog oog bone sky cloud. Mm. <laughs> and then he wakes up the next day and it's foggy and he's like, oh, my dream came true. <laughs> oh. Oog oog make spawn in sky. <laughs> oog oog sky baby, take over world. <laughs> The sky baby that will mount the world. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> the Game of Thrones is an entirely different series if we change the dragons to cows. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> though she s would still be the Khaleesi of the Great Grass Plains, though. That would still be in the title, unfortunately. In any event... <laughs> um, there is... Uh, Others have also pointed to civilizations, such as the Aztecs, who used psychedelic mushrooms, at least uh, among the priestly class, that didn't reflect McKenna's model of how psychedelic drug use cultures would behave. For example, carrying out human sacrifice. Not very mellow. <laughs> not chill in the slightest. No, not something that you would usually associate with like stoner comedy is people, you know, cutting someone's <laughs> chest open and ripping their heart out. I actually wouldn't mind seeing a, uh, a Seth Rogen um, movie like that where it actually he, he stumbles into a time machine. And he's back in the Aztecs and it's I got almost you. like, oh, I, I, sorry, I got too excited. No, it's like George Lucas <laughs> producing Harold and Kumar go to Kalima. <laughs> <laughs> The drug scene will be the best one ever. Indeed, you just see him staring at a heart, like ah, <laughs> Kalima Shokti Day. <laughs> okay, that's an Indiana Jones reference for those who are playing the home game and not paying attention. But okay, so. <laughs> There are also uh, some examples of Amazonian tribes, such as the Yivaro and the Yanomami, who use uh, ayahuasca ceremoniously, who are also known to engage in extremely violent behavior. Uh, and, of course, uh, this has also been argued it, it would indicate the use of psychedelic plants doesn't necessarily suppress the ego and create harmonious societies that's what they're driving at here okay is okay. the part about ayahuasca causing violence true because i feel like everything i've ever heard about it is it just makes people barf and then lay down and have a trip so it doesn't what what they're saying is that um they're not necessarily violent because of the ayahuasca they okay. are a tribe that uses ayahuasca and are also exceedingly violent outside of this <laughs> yeah they're and not so they're not related gotcha. okay. they just yeah. are they so, both occur his claims that it would cause an instantaneously harmonious environment that you would all take these drugs and feel some connectivity to one another is kind of debunked by studying these things in practice. So not quite in keeping with what he was speculating. Okay. So with all of that said, whatever your religious, political, 
ideological associations may be, and whatever the mechanisms might be which created human consciousness, call it fate, call it luck, call it karma. Evolution, intelligent design, any of the things, a rose by any other name would still smell like shit. And so... <laughs> We will end here, because we're here now with enough mental clarity to lie about how all of this coalesced. And so, that is going to wrap it up for my particular installment this week. So there you are, huh. friends. The was... Stoned Ape Hypothesis. I like it. It was, it was very intellectual. Mm. And... And I feel like I did not contribute enough shit jokes, and for that I apologize. <laughs> well, it's okay. I tried to pick up the slack or the scat for you, so it's it's perfectly fine. I really shit the bed on that one. You were pretty shit-faced through the entirety of this show, I understand. I don't even know where I am right now. Who are you? <laughs> is Nixon still president? Indeed. What year is it? Whew. And have we discovered scat yet? <laughs> Scatting so. or scat? Two totally uh, different things. Uh, Scatman Crothers, yes. Ah. He's taking it all back to The Shining one more time again. So, <laughs> do we have any stabs from you astute listeners on the call with me? No. I, tr I tried. You did well as well. I am curious about the order of events that you gave as far as getting high. Like, did he really propose that, like, first you got a lot of energy and then you had the sexual energy, and then the third tier was enlightenment? Yes. So all of those are based on increasing uh, the dosage, so right. prolonged exposure. And yes, that is the way that he depicted it, is that you would initially start out with just a little bit of usage, and that would, of course, lead to A, B, and C, and then the more that you increase the dosage, these other things would also then begin to manifest, is what he claimed. Hmm. Yeah, I got nothing. We really failed, Michael. We're both fired. Like now fuck. it's just the Shane podcast. <laughs> I can talk to myself. It's fine. <laughs> oh, well, give it to us. Okay. So here are the four lies. Uh the first one, I will admit I I anticipated that uh, because someone was missing, we might not necessarily have folks that would rapidly jump on this. But uh, Stanley Kubrick's uh, ad adaptation of Arthur Clarke's 2001 A Space Odyssey took place in 1968. That was when that was published, uh, or when it came out. Oh. McKenna's book came out in 1992, oh. uh, and so there's a bit of separation. And I did trick you, though I did say uh, that some of his influence was felt prior to the book's publication, but that's a bit of a jump. Um, yeah. So that's lie number one, <laughs> that uh, it, uh, it didn't have anything to do with Kubrick's adaptation of 2001. In fact, McKenna and Kubrick were not close associates, which is lie number two. They never encountered each other as far as I could tell. There were, however, some online sort of missives that were extrapolating that there were parallels between things that McKenna postulated, specifically the theory about time and everything being drawn forward to the eschaton. That's true. And they did use the monolith as an example of this, but Kubrick didn't get that from McKenna. I have no idea. It's, it's basically probably in Clark's book, and, you know, Kubrick's just shooting it, essentially. Fair. Uh, so... That is a continuation of one and two are those two to, to get you through those lies there. Uh, <laughs> and as far as I'm aware, Ken Kesey and McKenna, as well as Ken Kesey and Stanley Kubrick, had nothing to do with each other. Uh, there's The only connective tissue is that uh, Jack Nicholson was in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's <laughs> Nest and The Shining, and that's basically it. So that's the explanation as why those things are ludicrous is a claim, but. Well, fuck. I know. <laughs> so those are the first two. Lie number three. Oh, you poor souls. Um, Courtney was hinting around at it, but uh, mm. we didn't get entirely there. So the proposition that boundaries would dissolve and that community bonding and sexual activities would occur, that's true. The eventual metaphysical transcendence into the greater understanding of the connectivity of all things is me. So... <laughs> 
Further, <laughs> furthermore, I miss that. <laughs> the connection between Native American cultures uh, and him drawing that parallel, he did absolutely not draw that parallel. That was just me, which is why when Michael started sniffing around, <laughs> I was waiting for him to call bullshit on my explanation. But apparently I uh, lied well enough in the moment that I managed to yeah. fib my way through that. So nope, you did. You did. I have met the mandate of the show finally, oh. only 150 <laughs> episodes in. So that's great. I knew enough about the topic to lie convincingly about it. So there we are. <laughs> but yeah, he didn't make any connectivity to Native American cultures or lore. That's purely just me extrapolating. But that would have gave his theory, I think, more credence. You'd think. Credence. <laughs> Because I've said that multiple times in the last couple of weeks here. There are women walking the planet by the name of Credence, and I would love for you to call them Credence to their face once. I just want to watch the reaction. Oof. All right, and the final lie, lie number four, is that uh, this is the other thing that Courtney's question about religion kind of sniffed around. McKenna did not claim that the origin for the deification of cattle in the Hindu religion was drawn from this particular theory. Uh, it Technically, the sacred cow, the reverence for the cows, is the traditionally agrarian Vedic Hindu society, and that stems from the reluctance to harm an animal whose milk humans consume after being weaned from their mother's milk. Has nothing to do with whether or not we found, you know... Uh, mushrooms in their spore, as it were. Well, I mean, I, I kind of freaking figured, know that. I, sh I, I figured as much that uh -huh. the truth of the basis of the Hindu religion had nothing to do with what he was saying. Yes. But I honestly thought that he was just trying to explain it all together. Yes, he was he, crazy uh -huh. enough to draw the parallels. He didn't really make any parallels to modern uh, culture. No. Because like, both of those things that you said were both your yep. invention. Yes. Huh. Um, spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. I, As I was yeah. reading through this, most of his stuff is a very bland physiological uh, conclusion. So he's just judging based purely on how the drug makes us physically manifest responses. And then would lightly or blithely allude to the fact that it's like, oh, yes, and also you'll feel metaphysically and, and tingly. That's, you know, it's the foundation for speech and religion and music, but he doesn't really give you any examples as far as I'm aware. It's just kind <laughs> of vague descriptors on the exterior. So I decided to make a few I wonder why leaps. nobody took it seriously. Strange, isn't it? Music huh. and, and science and hand-waving <laughs> gestures and blah, blah, blah. But it does them all. Well, well, if you're interested in the show notes, um, the Wikipedia article about this and uh, there is a Scientific American article that I cite for this, I think the they actually discuss um, at several scientific uh, seminars recently. There are a pair of doctors who are now starting to try to espouse this theory openly in public, and they're arguing <laughs> he did make rational conclusions based on now our more frequent use of uh, psilocybin and our understanding of a human biological response to it. So they're claiming he, he might not have made all the connective points that uh, science would typically expect from a theory like this, uh, but they are claiming some of what he said is true. And in point of fact, it's probably a more reasonable uh, evaluation of evolution than we would have gotten otherwise so uh you can look that up and, and peruse that a little bit but there are scientists these days that are starting to espouse this other than joe rogan so he was just a couple <laughs> my of, favorite scientist indeed the only scientist um he, he was just a couple of decades and a lot of um drug experimentation you know ahead of his time uh-huh Okay. I, I mean, that he still published this in the 90s, so, uh, but he was just shy of mankind being thrown off the top of hell in the cell. I mean, he would have learned a lot more about evolution <laughs> if he had witnessed that, but... That man had a family. Indeed. I said, Ooh. you know, stop the damn mushroom. That's what I said. But... <laughs> stop eating the damn mushrooms! <laughs> So I believe that is going to officially uh, nail the lid shut on this particular episode. And uh, thank you all for bearing with me. I know that was a very text-heavy scientific study, but I do have to occasionally dabble in the, in the Michael realms just to keep you interested. <laughs> 
I loved it. I thought it was great. Yeah, no, it was very, it was very highfalutin intellectualism. Indeed. And next time, I'll talk about uh, a uh, what would we say? Oh, a an Shit. inconspicuous murderer. <laughs> oh, inconspicuously. <laughs> uh, uh. Indeed. Yes, I was very excited about that because I had just done a little bit of that research and it's fresh in my mind. But uh, yeah, it's going to be a, a good time when we get around to that. So something to look forward to for the future. Seven weeks from now. But uh, <laughs> so thank you all for being here as always. We hope you enjoyed the show as much as we did creating it because it is always a grand time. Uh, if you enjoyed what you hear, uh, then of course you can express that rapture by liking, subscribing, rating, and reviewing because we would of course love to hear from you. And it's always <laughs> glorious for us to, to get feedback from you fabulous fans out there. There is a link tree uh, below in the show notes here that'll get you to all of our relevant socials. And of course, we have new episodes winging your way every lovely Monday if this is your first foray with us, which if it is, hi, welcome. Hello. Every podcast is someone's first podcast, I suppose, and you picked a doozy to start on. <laughs> it's my first time. We won't be gentle. We've had mushrooms. My consciousness is dissolved. Indeed. Like an Aztec. <laughs> I divide and conquer. So, uh, you can, of course, also find us on the Tubes of You with frequently occurring uh, installments over there of a video format, and we'll try to keep that interesting. We've now revived the Chuck Klosterman of it all yes. and are diving into, as you can see over my left shoulder here, if you're on the video feed... Uh, all three of you. Uh, we have these super <laughs> theticals that you can explore. It's a delightful time. We'll see whether or not that is as interesting on the second and third attempt as it was the first time out. And of course, <laughs> keep checking us out on TikTok, Instagram, all the fun places where we make nonsense happen. But yeah, go and for don't it. forget to get into Michael Shorts. He Please. will really appreciate it if you get into his shorts. There's so He's been many working shorts. Really hard. My so favorite many. joke. Just get in on them. Dive in, face first. Yes, they or match the American span of attention and the ability to hold out. Apparently, sixteen seconds. <laughs> All I right. I can't say that never happens, but well, just like premature ejaculation, this show has come to a strange conclusion. And so, for the disinformed <laughs> podcast this week, I'm Shane. I'm Michael. I'm Courtney. And zippity zoop, we're out of here. <laughs>